You're listening to audio from the Village Church, a community that's formed by the gospel and sent on God's mission, gathering weekly in the heart of downtown Hamilton, Ohio. For more information about the village or to connect with us, you can find us online at myvillagechurch.com. Welcome to the Form and Send podcast, a podcast by the Village Church, uh, for the Village Church that meets in downtown Hamilton, Ohio. My name is Scott. I'm one of the pastors here of the Village, and with me today is... Michael. Hey, all. I'm one of the pastors as well. And Matt Tucker. Hey, all. I'm one of the pastors as well. <laughs> now, you can't say that. You cannot say that. Hey, all. Um, so, uh, we're here today. It's been a while since you've done just a kind of a regular Form and Send podcast episode, um, but we uh, today are talking about slavery in the scriptures and uh before we even jump into the questions like our posture of heart uh even as we're talking about this obviously we're coming at it as pastors and and know that we have uh influence and we are aware of that um just within the village church uh but we're really coming at this as learners and disciples uh to the scriptures as well as we seek to grow and learn and understand in this stuff too and so um yeah one of the reasons we love doing this is because we get to spend time learning uh, and growing together that we might um, invite you all, whoever listened to this, to learning and growing with us. So um, it's kind of a big deal, a big topic, and uh, hopefully what comes through here is our, uh, at least a posture of humility um, Mm -hmm. as we approach um, a very uh, important, I think, topic uh, in the Bible. And so to kick things off, um, why in the world are we even talking about this today? Why are we doing an episode on (laughs) on slavery? (laughs) Great question. Just, Just because we like to stir up stuff or what? <clears throat> I can jump in. Sure. A couple reasons. And Michael <laughs> add to it. Um, first of all, the Bible speaks to it, and we we study the Bible, and we base all of our lives as Christians off of that. So that's one of the main reasons. Second, um, we are actually preaching on this in about a week and a half, um, maybe less than that when you hear this podcast. But so we want to know how to inform our church and what the, what the, these verses say, and, and kind of just how to navigate those situations. And then maybe lastly, for what I have is. For us in America, maybe you're listening abroad, I don't know. but um, Our international audience. Our international audience. This yes. is less for you today than um, usual. We dealt with slavery in our past, and unfortunately it kind of still exists. And so we need to know what God says in his word about it and let that shape and inform how we continue to navigate that even today. And so some of the things. It's, it's beautiful. Great. Yeah, I, I mean, for real, that's beautiful. I, I affirm that. Uh, I just have a picture of a fire uh, in my notes here. The world seems to be on fire around some of these things, and like, uh, and so we have some meaning to we, the <laughs> we thought it would be, uh, man, like, yeah, timely and, and whatever. And certainly, there are things that we don't respond to with haste, and there are things that we get to speak to, um, you know, within reason, or like you said, Scott, within influence. And so, for us, as we preach through the Bible, um, which which we do on the regular, and we encounter things that are difficult for us, and so to be clear. Um, much of what we're sharing is stuff from others and gleanings and kind of uh, stuff that we've kind of put together in our own brains, but but we don't own this stuff. None of us at this table are Old Testament scholars uh, by trade or anything like that, and so we learn from others and New Testament as well. But uh, yeah, so as we navigate, like Matt said, we're going to be hitting on some just difficult stuff, and we thought it'd be helpful for us to kind of do a, a bit of a deep dive. And this podcast, honestly, is a good outlet for us to talk mm-hmm. about cultural stuff, mm-hmm. for us to learn and grow in a short period of time. Um, Scott puts together some helpful resources for us, and we kind of go at it for a week or so, and then come together and declare some rough thoughts um, for an hour or so. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, that's cool. So before we actually get into the weeds on you know just what the Bible says about stuff, about slavery, about all those things, like are there I guess are there big picture things that we need to put out there to like help lay a foundation for this conversation before we just go there? Is there any, anything that you want to hit on before we just jump into it? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I mean, just two real quick, and maybe we could put a hundred bumpers out there, but mm-hmm. one is just um, creational intent. When we look at this, it's a human issue. Um, <clears throat> before the scriptures began, uh, from our lenses afterwards, now, I mean, this is a, a human issue, and so when we're talking about issues of humanity and and all the stuff around that, we have to be mindful of some of the doctrines that help us from cover to cover in the scriptures, and one of those being like Imago Dei, that we're, mm-hmm. that we're all image bearers made in the image of God as humans, and so that's a thing. Um, and then when we talk about like, creational intent, 
we'll probably hit on this again, but you know, um, it would be a, a tough sell to say that when God made Adam and Eve, that He had in His mind, okay, like you're gonna uh, make Adam and Eve, and you know, we have animals and all this stuff, and like slavery is gonna be a good thing, and it's gonna be a part of your story. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, <clears throat> right? That that's not true, and so sin has its work, and we'll kind of. Talk through some of that stuff. Um, and then, man, just super helpful stuff and, and some of the things we've been digesting. But, like, God chose enslaved people to be his people, mm-hmm. which is the flip of all that stuff. And it just shows us God's heart for the lowly, and, and we'll hit on that, I'm, I'm sure. But, um, yeah, so a lot of this stuff uh, culturally, um, it takes some work. We don't mm-hmm. understand. We can't just plunk our current minds down in ancient Israel and assume that we have the lenses that they had. And so mm-hmm. it takes some um, kind of historical work to kind of sit in there with them. And, and hopefully maybe we can help a little bit with that today. So Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Another thing I thought of in preparing for this is that we should never like isolate a verse like this and then draw conclusions about God simply from that. Mm-hmm. What we get to do is we get to look at all of the Bible in light of God's character and then hopefully understand these verses in light of that and the whole thing. Because it'd be easy to take one of these verses and be like, this is, I don't, I wouldn't want to serve. God who said this out of one yeah. passage, but we get to look at God's character throughout all the Bible and his, his grace and his love and his justice and then understand these verses better. Um, another thing which I thought was helpful is we get to note where he talks about slavery and it's it's really quick on the draw in regards to shaping his people. Mm-hmm. Like he rescues them from Egypt. <clears throat> he gives them the Ten Commandments and then almost directly right after that, this is like obviously like one of the mm-hmm. important things on his mind is to say, how should we treat people and how should we build this community and how should we, you know, it, care for the, the needs of those around us in regards to slaves or, or work and all that. And so I do think even just where he puts it is helpful to know that this is on God's heart. Mm-hmm. And it's not just like a flippant thought at some point throughout the Bible, but it's like direct. This is, I think, very um, instrumental to building his people as he wants them to know how to treat others and care for one another. Yeah, no, that's really good. Uh, yeah, if you've been, if you've worked in places or maybe even like growing up, you had rules in your house or if you've ever heard about like, listen to a podcast or I don't know, watched a YouTube video of like, I, I think I saw one the other day of somebody went around playing blackjack in libraries in a certain city or state <laughs> literally just because it was like breaking some weird, obscure state law or something at some point. So he was like, he was playing blackjack, inviting just random strangers, playing blackjack with him in the library because it was technically against the law just to break these weird laws. <laughs> um, but there's probably a story behind why that actually is is a mm-hmm. law, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. which is true, like any policy you have at work or, you know, rules you have at home or whatever. <clears throat> those are built maybe from common sense, but also from real things that have happened that you're trying to guard against yeah. in some way. And so even when we come to the scriptures and see that it speaks to like, man, if your slave does this, then this happens. Or if this happens and do this, like, like those things can sound like, uh, to your point, Michael, that maybe there are, there's like a creational intent or that God's like, like that's an affirmation Mm -hmm. or design or an intended thing that he thinks is good. And it's like, no, he's, he's regulating something um, that already exists in the world that, and to your point, Matt, like that God's people were already intimately familiar with as former slaves themselves, yep. you know. And so uh, for us to like look at what the Bible says about slavery and just distinguish between just because there are laws or rules around something doesn't mean that there's an affirmation of slavery as an institution as being this really great thing um, or something that God delights in, but but he is regulating it um, in some way, shape, or form. And a couple of things that... Um, I looked at, uh, brought up Matthew 19 when Jesus is approached by Pharisees and, hey, like, is it true that, uh, you know, you can just kind of divorce people for any reason at all? And Jesus, like, goes back to creation and basically says, well, the intent is that nothing would ever separate, you know, a husband and a wife because God's the one who joins those together. And then the Pharisees are like, well, then... Why in the heck did Moses give us, you know, this thing about certificates of divorce? Why would he make that lawful at all? And, you know, basically Jesus just says, because of your hardness of heart. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because sin is a real thing. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why Moses, like, not not to accommodate sin, but to honestly mitigate it yeah. and protect other people from further harm and damage of it. There's some processes and some some regulations around that. And so... We would look at slavery very similarly, that God entered into a world in which slavery was already a thing. And he's not affirming it. He's not saying that's the created intent. 
And yet he is also saying, and here's how like this might be reformed mm -hmm. in a way that, that protects, uh, even despite the fact that this is not like, man, how I would want to have things, but because of the hardness of heart, because of the fall, because of, you know, limited resources, even as we'll get into talking about slavery and certain kinds of it, like there are just some guards that we have to have around this thing. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Like th that's a helpful distinction, at least for me yeah. in studying to be aware of. So. And the last thing maybe you have to add to that in, in terms of like just context is that I don't think we should view slavery in the Bible only through the lens mm -hmm. of slavery in America. Mm -hmm. It'd be easy to, to view slavery in the Bible and to think it was exactly like it happened in America, which for yeah. America was cruel and horrible and we totally reject all that. But like, I think it looks a little different potentially in the Bible. And mm -hmm. so just to not be viewing it only through that lens is probably helpful as we talk through some of these things. Yeah. It's, it's a huge. great reminder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That like it's so easy because that's what we know. That's what we think that's, of when we yeah. hear slavery, and and so it's easy to just lay our definition on top of the text, which is yeah. the definition of eisegeting, <laughs> like yeah. putting our own meaning into the scriptures that actually doesn't exist there. Um, so to that end, uh, it's a great segue, Matt. Um, in terms of like, what does the Bible actually mean when it talks about slavery? So if it's not talking about our American idea of slavery, what is it referring to when it talks mm -hmm. about slavery? Um, you go. I'm, I can get. I'll, I'll jump in. I'll <laughs> yeah, jump go for it. No one wants to be the first one to no, jump sure. in to answer questions this, this episode. We, we joked around. We were saying Scott was going to answer his own question. <laughs> hey, Matt, let me interrupt you on that. Um, here. We also have Mickey, Mickey Mouse on the podcast today. <laughs> um, but anyways, we, we go back to normal stuff. Um <laughs> I, this is from articles that Scott, Scott used to send us and stuff like that, but I've kind of found four maybe um, opportunities for opportunities for slavery sounds horrible. Um, ways someone might be a slave yeah. is, is um, maybe in Israel there was someone who was unable just to survive. Maybe the job wasn't paying the bills. Maybe um, they had run into hard times. Maybe there's a sickness or whatever, and they were um, outside of their own um, desire and obviously working hard. They, they kind of gave themselves to another person to work for them, to make money, to just have a way of living. Um, and because largely there was no social security, there was no mm -hmm. stimulus checks, there was no food stamps. And so what else were they to do? And so this was maybe one of the better ways um, slavery actually existed. And, and we probably wouldn't even today look at that and call it slavery. Right. We might call it, you, you got a job for somebody else. But I think that might fall under this category um, as someone who would go to work for that. Um, maybe number two is um, someone actually got into a lot of debt foolishly and, and they were they were just required to work for somebody else until they could pay off that debt. We see scripture passages in the Bible on that. Mm -hmm. um, another way is maybe it's actually a form of punishment where there was someone who committed crimes or whatever like that and their, their punishment might have been to, you know, whatever, work for something. And then lastly, we also see some other, see some things where it's like slaves from war or mm -hmm. foreigners that had no land would maybe fall into that category of slavery as well. Yep. So those are some of the maybe initial ones. Super helpful. And some of those help like when you, I mean, we've already seen it in Exodus, I think last week of the week. Oh yeah. Uh, coveting. Yeah. You know, you're male servant or your female servant. You're like, hold on, huh? <laughs> like, <laughs> it, but then you like, and so like, how does that happen? How mm -hmm. is there like this dynamic in which someone is a servant and it's not like we have servant leaders around here. It's like no, <laughs> you, you no, possess servant. them in some, you yeah. know, like what is that or whatever. And so, I mean, I, I I love that, Matt. I think that's a helpful overview. There there are a few like, lest we minimize some realities. Like when you read about the Egyptians, like what we can't do is say Egyptians, uh, slaves, terrible. God talks about well, no, it was he loved them. <laughs> yeah, and, you yeah, know, and yeah. it's like yeah. hold on, like we can agree that slavery in terms of like Egyptian. Mm -hmm. Slavery was was cruel, mm -hmm. and um, and so there's a contrast there mm -hmm. for sure. In that, you know, God is mindful that His people have been slaves for 400 years mm -hmm. when He sets out to kind of establish this covenantal mm -hmm. code or whatever. So, I mean, slavery, uh, Egyptian slavery, wasn't good. It was harsh yeah. and it was brutal, yeah. and even that was different than um, you know modern uh, American Southern. Sure. Whatever slavery, but like uh, so that's a thing. And then mm -hmm. you think about other times you see the word throughout the scriptures, mm -hmm. like we are slave to sin. Like mm -hmm. that means that we're like we read that we're like shackled to sin. Yeah. That's probably fair. Like mm -hmm. it it is master over you. All right. And so mm -hmm. like it's not like these concepts are foreign completely. Um, yeah. But then you have some of the working kind of societal relationships. Mm 
with tons of room for abuse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and in many in many of those instances, even that you described, Matt, it might be on the slaves' initiative that they establish that relationship. Mm-hmm. I have nowhere else, you know, nowhere else to go. Yeah. Can I tend to your farm? Yeah. Sure. And and it's, you know, not just indentured Jacob seven years for your daughter. Yeah. Oh, not that daughter. Crap. <laughs> I wish I would have written this uh, contract a little yeah. more clearly. <laughs> but like, and, and so like, there's just a ton of variety, I guess yeah. is what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. No, I, I think uh, to look at kind of like buckets, and Matt, you gave a lot of good reasons for why um, slaves can can actually come into existence or why someone will be a slave <clears throat> to look at even like there's there are distinctions uh, between God's people, like other fellow mm-hmm. Israelites or other fellow Hebrews. If that kind of indentured yeah. servitude like relationship was there, there's a distinction between like what slavery might have looked like for those versus um, yeah, the prisoners of war, you yep. know, like those who aren't Israelites, what does that relationship look mm-hmm. like? And so when we look at, um, yeah, like for fellow Israelites, those who fell on hard times, um, who had debts that they had to pay or whatever, um, in Exodus 21, which is like part of the focal passage mm-hmm. that we're going to be looking at um, in a couple Sundays as of recording this podcast, um, it makes it very clear that Israelites were not to be slaves, servants of other Israelites for more than six years, yeah. right? After six years, then that was done. Mm-hmm. Um, they were free to go. Uh, and in fact, I think um, later in the scriptures uh, talks about how like they're actually to be to be sent off with like more stuff, yes. right? Yeah. Give them, yeah. give them stuff. Don't just send them off with nothing, you know, free of debt, but actually give them some supplies, some money, some whatever to so that they they're not starting. With nothing, and then just wind up back <laughs> where yeah, they began yeah. again, you know. So um, I think that's a, a helpful distinction, um, even there. Whereas uh, with like those who are prisoners of war, like you, you could be a slave like just indefinitely, yeah. you know, you and your family or whatever. And you mentioned this, Matt. Part of it is because they didn't have any land to go back to. Yeah. Like they didn't have anything. They weren't part of you know God's covenant people with the inheritance and all that stuff. And so when God's people are in their land, I mean they like. What do they do? Just send them out to go be killed on their own? Or like, and it's almost like, well, what's the better option? You know, where they should they just slay them? Should they? What should they do? Or should they like actually invite them in and say, all right, like you are not one of us. You are mm-hmm. like our enemy, and yet at the same time, we're going to like we will provide for you, and you're also going to work for us in some way. So, yeah. but that could go on in uh, perpetuity or whatever. Um, yeah, uh, and then I think it's helpful to even look at the New Testament um, because there are obviously slaves there too. We hear Paul and other folks speak to uh, slaves in the New Testament, mm-hmm. and like when we get there, um, Israel is no longer in charge, right? And so it's the Romans that are in charge. And so when we when we talk about slavery in the New Testament, it's not a slavery that is like even regulated by the Lord. It's slavery that is instituted by you know, the Roman Empire, the, the Greco-Roman culture or whatever. And so um, even that's almost like a third different, like, category of slavery that is different. It's distinct from what we see in uh, in the Old Testament. And, and that, there, there are less protections, and we'll get into some of those probably when we talk about the difference between uh, slavery in the Bible and, and American mm-hmm. slavery. But less protections for sure um, in the New Testament because, again, God wasn't regulating that stuff. Um, but it was really more in the Old Testament, not so much about, like, um, about the fact that you were a slave, but it was more about like who you were a slave to, um, which is really interesting. And so like you could be a slave of someone who was high class and wealthy mm-hmm. and all those things. And, and you wouldn't be able to necessarily know if you're looking around a community like who's a slave and who's not. Um, yeah. could be someone's slave that like has a lot more than you do, like inheriting a ton, wealthy, educated, educated <laughs> you know, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so even that, like that, that is different from Old Testament stuff, which is different than you know, American slavery. So yeah, lots of distinctions to go around there, but um, anything else to add? There's lots of details that we could probably fill in and we could talk more, but anything else you guys want to speak to there? Cool. So let's speak specifically then to maybe like how does slavery that we see in the scriptures, how does that differ um, from, from what we know and are familiar with and reading (laughs) history books about, you know, America, what we learned in school or what we're learning about today. What's the distinction between the two? Uh, a couple observations before we kind of hit on some several kind of a list of things or whatever but like I thought this was a helpful lens like there is not an explanation of how it got there 
Mm-hmm. Even like as we're journeying in Exodus, like so God pulls them out of slavery and then all of a sudden he's like saying, Hey, this is how you treat your slaves. It's like yeah. what? Huh? <laughs> like yeah. so there's not it's but it is a portal to view how it's playing out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and so that's Old Testament, but then that's true. I mean, we only have a letter to a you know, like to a church or to a person that's kind of like with a couple lines. And so it's like, what is going on here? Yeah. We're gleaning uh, through a, a narrow portal. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, there were certainly laws of conduct. Mm-hmm. And when I think about like the atrocity of slavery, I think of no voice, no value, no, you know, like it, like they were possession, less than human. Mm-hmm. And so it was like whatever... Mm-hmm. Just like the the master could literally have their way in whatever way that was, and and then nobody's going to say anything about it, and th- that's not even wrong. Yeah. And so, from the get go, there are laws of conduct that God is establishing in the way that His people live, um, in contrast to the world around them. Although they do live in the world around them, mm-hmm. and so. Um, so one, and man, we can just add to this or whatever as, as it go along, but it was not racial. It was not based on, uh, a, color. yeah, a race. It, yeah. it was, it was like, it, it may have been based on, um, yeah, some conquering or whatever, but largely it was not like, oh, you're a slave. You're of this race. It was not uh, dehumanizing. Mm-hmm. And again, like we'll point to this many times, but it valued the integrity of, of humanity, mm-hmm. um, and gosh, we see that a ton in specific instances in Scripture. To your point, Scott, of like after, uh, so, so it wasn't lifelong um, for for Israel. And mm-hmm. though there's like a little bit of gray area, like uh, it was potentially generational for the conquered, and that's like tough yeah. or whatever. But then uh, when you came in, if you had a family, when you then you left, you had a family. Mm-hmm. And if you g- gained a wife while you were there, <laughs> then you could leave without her. Right. Um, or you could sign up and say, no, I want to stick around. Like. Mm-hmm. And so who, I mean, it's a tough thing, but who yeah. would want to do that, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so like, but, but it, it proves the point that it's like, no, like we're, yeah, you're, you're receiving things on your way out. It's not just, mm-hmm. what am I supposed to do? Walk down this winding driveway and then, then what? What am yeah. I going to do? And so um, there were protections. Uh, I mean, I, it's so unique. If you've not spent any time reading, um, you know, just type in Old Testament mm-hmm. slavery passages. And just see what God says about like, oh, mm. if your slave is hit and he loses his eye, then he gets to be freed. Or if he mm. loses a tooth, like you can imagine some funny scenarios or something where somebody's like wiggling a tooth and trying to get punched. <laughs> or something. I mean, yeah. honest to goodness, like, because then you have a right to be free or whatever. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, yeah, sought um, as a last effort for gainful employment, mm-hmm. you know, like kind of lower societal structure. Um, there was sanctuary for escape. So unlike, hey, if, if a slave escapes, cut their hand off. Or if a slave escapes, shoot them on sight. Mm-hmm. Um, or if you find a, uh, an es- escaped slave, then you're culpable or whatever. It was, it was just the opposite. Like yeah. you can actually legitimately be a sanctuary place for an escaped or freed slave. Yeah. Um, just to name a few. Yeah, no, I think that even that goes to like the the assumption is like you you believe <laughs> that you believe the slave that's run away, like the refugee that there's like there was abuse or there was yeah. something happening there that they are fleeing from something unhealthy and unhelpful. Yeah, which is it's totally opposite of what we saw with the, the whole effort of the underground railroad and everything like it was such a such a thing why and, was it underground yeah i mean and and even like policing groups that were formed to like find slaves that ran away to bring them back the orders like it's just, it's totally opposite of what we experienced here mm-hmm. and with american slavery um then yeah what we see in the scriptures and to sum up all that mm-hmm. like it feels like the the most basic comparison is that in the bible god set these things up for the good of the slave to protect them, to provide and, and actually help them in some way to flourish or have mm-hmm. a way out of a better life. The comparison for America was that it felt like it was dehumanizing. And like you said, they were, they had no rights and it was just to kind of take as much from them as, as humanly possible mm-hmm. just to drain them and then discard them. And so I think the comparisons there are drastic <laughs> night and day differences from God's intent. If this was to happen versus what we see in like the 1800s and stuff like that. Yeah, no. Uh, there's a, uh, I mean, I think even looking at, you know, kind of heading on the fact that it wasn't wasn't over some sort of ethnic superiority or 
anything like that at all. Even the system itself, I think looking at um, looking at the way that the system was set up, at least between Israelites, like that wasn't like they knew that wasn't the ideal. Like the the purpose was not to keep mm-hmm. other folks in slavery or in servitude forever. <clears throat> like the ideal was to like get them to a place where they were independent yeah. and self sufficient again. And so that's where like you get laws against uh, charging interest mm-hmm. for other people or laws against simply trying to make a profit off yeah. of like their servitude and all those sorts of things. That was not the goal at all. And then, and then even looking at like the Jubilee stuff, yeah. uh, which is a part of that too, that it's not just every six years, you know, like or folks could only be in servitude for every, uh, for, for six years, but then every 49 years, like everything was reset, like back to every, every tribe got their lane back, yeah. everything reset that way. Um, and so like, yeah, that was just kind of built into God's people knowing that, man, there's going to be folks that fall on hard times. There are going to be instances where people get themselves in debt. Or even like, you know, our, uh, again, in Exodus 21, part of the focal passage in a couple of weeks, like, you know, yeah, marrying, like, your daughters, like, selling your daughters. And it's like, there, there's going to be a, a point where some dads aren't going to be able to pay dowry stuff for, like, a for <clears throat> bride and, you know, marriage and all that stuff. And so, like, like that's a that's a piece of it and so this is a way to accommodate for that but it's not the goal you know like it's not meant to like be that way forever and so there's this built-in kind of reset uh to that which i think is um is is incredibly different from what we see as well where um yeah it was fought against we fought a war you know in part over this stuff because we didn't want to you know let that go um also just like the idea of like abuse not Mm -hmm. being tolerated at all um you know we see that in uh Exodus 21, like it's it's uh, uh, physical abuse, right? So if you like knock a slave's tooth out or whatever, that dude goes free. I mean, if you like hit him and punch him in the eye and he can't see anymore, you hit him in the tooth, knock a tooth out. Like it, like that wasn't allowed. You weren't allowed to abuse slaves. Yeah. <laughs> like he got to go free. Um, if if you happen to kill a slave, then like your life was taken mm-hmm. as well because they was viewed as. An image bearer, just as equal to you, like the human life. There wasn't no, yeah, objectification, no three fifths or whatever. It was a, a person to a person, um, yeah. And so, like the physical abuse was not okay. This the even like sexual abuse. Again, mm-hmm. going back to like selling your daughter in slavery, um, you know, like that the person you sold her to could not abuse her mm-hmm. in any way, shape, or form if if he decided to treat her as a wife to put it that way or yeah. give her to a son then all of a sudden she was to be treated as family yeah. um and so like that was a thing you couldn't just sell her off to whoever you couldn't objectify her in that way you couldn't give her to foreign like mm-hmm. she was yours you know um and so that was the thing that was uh fought against it even like the heavy hard labor that that you know michael you referred to with the egyptians um in exodus 20 in the commands in the ten commandments about sabbath like it's commanded that they're slaves yeah. Have to like have a Sabbath as well. They they take a Sabbath along with everyone else, and so even protection from like you know labor abuse in some way. Like there are those protections that we see threaded here in this text about slavery that uh, are just antithetical. That they weren't they didn't exist, um, mm-hmm. in in our version here uh, in America. So just even the encouragement to to be free, like mm-hmm. that was an encouraged yeah. thing. You know, um, at least in certainly in the Old Testament. That was a goal, but in the New Testament, like it was encouraged. It was a good thing to go get free. Paul encourages, you know, hey, if you can get your freedom, go get your freedom. Yep. You know, like it wasn't a, it wasn't a thing that, like, you, again, you tried to keep people from, even in the New Testament or whatever. And so that is a distinction yep. too. Um, so all right, like, this is distinctions helpful or whatever? But kind of, I think one of the big questions that folks have about slavery is like, but does the Bible, does it condemn it? Does it affirm slavery? Does it condone it? Like, what does it actually say about slavery? For, against, neutral, what do you got? Mm-hmm. It's like you're trying to bait us into making some declarations that are it is. dangerous, yeah. Scott. That's why I'm asking the questions. <laughs> uh, something's wrong with the tape, this tape. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I'd say first, like, we have to, I mean... We have to define slavery, which is what we've been doing for 15 yep. minutes. And so, um, you know, does it affirm transatlantic southern mm-hmm. slavery? Uh, it does not affirm that. Um, all For all the reasons we just said, that yeah. the dehumanizing and all those things. Um, but then in certain contexts. Uh, and so does it condemn 
slavery that belittles humanity? It absolutely mm-hmm. does that, right? Uh, it does not affirm that. Um, but does it condone in some aspect um, some type of uh, social structure that is called slavery? It, it seems to. Mm-hmm. It seems to allow it. And I think the divorce analogy is is just so good because it's like, Again, I think Matt set this up by saying it's not one verse that you're going to read and be like, there it is, God's mm-hmm. a monster, I yeah. knew it. There, But when you look at the idea around divorce and like, um, again, Adam and Eve, his desire was not that they would divorce mm-hmm. right. um, from the beginning and, and it wasn't allowed and you can't give a certificate. But then finally there's some accommodation in there um, or, or mitigation, mm-hmm. maybe it would be the better word, uh, of, of man's sin to like, gosh... It's almost like that because of your hardness of heart. Yeah, there's a let's at, at least make sure that this is not doing X, Y, or Z. And so, mm-hmm. in one of the things, uh, one of the guys, uh, I think it was one of the videos, uh, you'll put the stuff in the show notes. Yeah, I'll I guess, probably links that stuff in the show notes. Um, he said, given the reality of human sin, the Bible attempts, um, whatever, maybe that's not the best word, but to mitigate some of the damage regarding slavery in mm-hmm. the culture. Mm-hmm. And so, so God is coming into something that's existing, yep. and He's speaking in a way to to shine His light um, within uh, the culture that's kind of going on uh, around there. So there's some framework, social structure with sin at work, and again, uh, anytime there is uh, power in play, mm-hmm. then there is potential for abuse. Mm-hmm. And so God speaks to those things, and I, I think by and large, what you see is. Him uh, affirming the value and the dignity mm-hmm. of the poorest of the poor and the lowliest of the lowly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like you said, he's working in the context of brokenness, of the fall, of sin and the curse. And the good news is that one day, this will not be anymore. Um, even you know, back then, that all that will be forgiven, redeemed, paid for, whatever, mm-hmm. judged. And and one day, when God brings heaven to earth. We will not have to rest any of this stuff anymore. There will be none of this. And so even though it seems like today, well, why wouldn't God just whatever? Well, he has paid for it. It is, you know, dealt with in some way, shape, or form on the cross. And, and one day we will not have to experience this anymore at all, ever. Yeah, so. this is great. Um, yeah, I mean, my, like, perspective on this is, like, there's... God looks at slavery and I think what he's speaking to his people, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, you know, that which they kind of have some responsibility and authority and regulating and managing and that which they don't is like the Lord looks at that and speaks to them and says like there's a better way in mm-hmm. some ways to yep. do it than what you've seen in the culture. Um, and so I, I, I think he's less <clears throat> interested because we, we don't see him. We don't see him affirm it. This is not as ideal. And also he does to be, he does not like say deconstruct this institution. Like yep. he doesn't say that. Um, and I think it's because he's less interested in whatever the manifestation of the institution or the system actually is, but he's much more concerned with justice mm-hmm. flowing through it in the way that we view other humans. And are yeah. we are we caring for uh, the poor and, and the, the powerless and the oppressed and all those things? Are we are we being impartial yeah. in the way that we uh, do justice and, and mercy and all those things to um, one another, even in those systems that we would say are not ideal and so when we kind of come at it from that perspective then we can see get gosh like compared to surrounding cultures compared to what we have experienced in our uh nation's short history like the the kind of regulations and all that stuff that god has put in place here in the scriptures um it that's different right it seems to want to affirm the dignity and the imago dei and justice and all those things like even with those um who were who were slaves back then who were servants so um yeah and does it does it affirm it? No. Condemn it? No. Does it condone it? Eh, probably closer to that. But I think his heart is not that we get the system or the structure mm-hmm. right, but it's like, are we seeing each other that's rightly? Really and if, if we are, gosh, then that's going to change those systems and the way that we yeah. operate in them from the inside out, right? Yeah. And I think, again, not even so much to the divorce piece, but marriage. When you read marriage mm-hmm. with a modern lens, you have like many of the same questions, like, what? Like, oh, you know, the idea of an arranged marriage is bonkers to us. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. how can that? But then there are, like, so there's similarly in the way that the scripture speaks to that. Yeah. Like, why wouldn't he just condemn entirely that notion? But it's like, ah. Oh. Yeah. 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 As if, yeah, as if two people can't love each other and 
portray Mm -hmm. and display a relationship between Christ and the church and an arranged marriage worse or or can't do that at all or Mm -hmm. has to do it worse than like a romantic lovey-dovey, you know, like kind of a marriage that we have here, which is a relatively novel idea, honestly, (laughs) in human history. Um, Nice. Nice and novel. It's not, yeah, nice and novel, (laughs) for sure. Yeah, not knocking it at all. I like my marriage. Um, (laughs) uh, So I guess in terms of like, that's kind of speaking to maybe slavery then. So what, what, we've kind of, we've hit on this, we've talked about it a little bit, but like, does, like, do the scriptures affirm uh, condemn or condone the kind of slavery that we are more like intimately familiar with here when we think of slavery mm-hmm. in America, like the modern version of that. I would say, like, just what I have is the Bible is is never for any kind of slavery. Mm-hmm. Um, sure, like we just talked about, maybe a certain type of that is is maybe permissible, but I think God's plan is for life, for freedom, for love, and for care. And, and like you said, Scott, if we operate out of a kingdom mindset then honestly, there would be no need for slavery. Like mm-hmm. if we have the church caring for people and if we have uh, a, a mindfulness for people's good and, and for like a benevolence with our generosity and money and care, like I almost think that you would even have had to have worried about any of this in the first place probably. Yeah. And so if we operate out of that, slavery would probably not even be a thing. Mm-hmm. I feel like you're saying if you love God and love your neighbor, <laughs> then all of these laws will be That's fleshed kind of, out yeah, kind perfectly of by God's people. Um, yeah, I mean, I th- yeah, we, we did hit on a, a ton of this. I think, uh, man, just some interesting uh, passages like the First Timothy 1, 10. Uh, he's giving a list for those who strike their fathers and mothers for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homo- uh, homosexuality, enslavers, mm-hmm. liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. And so you're like... Huh. Slavery, yeah, yeah. That's that's a weird thing to throw in the list there, but mm-hmm. clearly it was a culture of cultural relevance, mm-hmm. and and you imagine that the mindfulness in that is the brutality that comes with the unrighteous power yeah. plays mm-hmm. uh, involved. But then, yeah, you have in um, what First Corinthians seven, what you alluded to, I think Scott is, um, if you can be free, be free. Yeah. But but I think he says, but if you can't, um, don't worry about it. Yeah, <laughs> which is like yeah. such a thing. You're like, hold on. The biggest picture, if we can zoom all the way out, and I think it's it's spot on, Matt. Like, if we get if we get God right and we get His love for us right, mm-hmm. then we get love for one another right. Then, kind of like all these things, man, they just they just fade away. Yeah. yeah. Um, but all of the instruction and and this this piece in Exodus is is case law. It is mm-hmm. is literally mm-hmm. um, an addendum to the Ten Commandments. It would have been yeah. like mm-hmm. uh, paper clipped to the back of it, uh, mm-hmm. of like, and these are some instances in which this these things might play out, yeah. right? For and so, yeah. yeah, for yeah, and so you just see it over and over again, and not everything's covered, and so, mm-hmm. uh, but and then the things that are covered certainly are there for a reason, yeah, which is just such a a, a neat thing that God speaks to us. In like very particular context, mm-hmm. you know? sure. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would say from what we've said of how like the contrast between what the, the Lord says and what again we experience with the transatlantic uh, slave trade, like it is. <clears throat> I wouldn't say it's night and day because slavery in the Bible wasn't fun either. Yeah. And and to be fair, like these regulations were here in the scriptures, probably because abuses took place, right? Yeah. And so even amongst God's people. Um, but all that to say, like they seem to be like fairly different um, and and in substance and in practice. And so, uh, yeah, I, I would say like, man, absolutely some the major tenets of the transatlantic slave trade, like the Lord would condemn based mm-hmm. on race and superiority kidnapping. and kidnapping. Yeah, <laughs> Exodus 21, uh, 16, like death penalty, not just for the kidnapper, but for the one who's even found with the person that was kidnapped, yeah. uh, right? Who like An accomplice. Yeah, an accomplice or whatever. And so, yeah, and like, just all the things just point like the finger and an accusation against this particular practice and expression of, mm-hmm. of slavery. And so, yeah, I think it's against it. Um, I also think as we look at um, even just it, as we look at like our culture today, like obviously in America, um, we, we don't have that slave trade anymore. Um, it's still in the, still in the books. Mm-hmm. Uh, the 13th Amendment, like... <laughs> still actually keeps slavery legal uh, right now if you commit a crime. Mm-hmm. Like that's, if you've not watched the documentary 13th on Netflix, 
yeah, political stuff you can filter through that if you have a discerning mind. Um, but it's some real stuff there about how that's played out in history and how that is still on the books. And yet, like, it, it makes me think about even the ways that we practice, like, the, the payday lending stuff today. Um, you know, what I think of when I, when I think of reading about how Old Testament Israel didn't want folks to get mm-hmm. stuck in this pattern of paying interest and debt. And this, this isn't supposed to be a permanent thing. And, like, whole <laughs> industries are built on, like, just trapping people and in interest mm-hmm. and all those things. Um, so I think it does make me think about other practices that, you know, whether it's racially motivated or not, certainly uh, a particular class of person mm-hmm. that seems to be kind of under the weight of some of this stuff. That It makes me think about other facets of our yeah. culture industry that, that could potentially be reformed in some way, shape, or form. But even to that, um, you know, kind of what I said earlier, I, I think God's less interested in uh, the institutions and systems and more about the justice would flow through them. And I think when we look at Old Testament slavery um, and we look at us today, uh, man, we're like, like America is not God's people, is not Israel. <laughs> and so I think as a church, when we take a look at some of this stuff, like we, we despite what the, the culture we live in, um, what those systems are or uh, how justice or injustice flows through those things. I think we get to take a look at what are our, like how do we operate and function even as God's people, as mm-hmm. a church, and does justice flow through us um, in those ways? Because America is really more like Rome in the New Testament who might have their own systems and the church is just trying to figure out what it looks like to operate <laughs> yeah. like in uh, in another in another country or another nation's like world yeah. in some way. Um, and so I think we get to, to take that perspective even as we, you know, kind of look at some of this stuff and how that might apply um, to us today. So we get to think about ourselves as God's people uh, and, and what does that look like, um, justice expressed, you know, through us and those things. Absolutely. Uh, so in terms of like even just talking about all this stuff, um, thinking about, yeah, God's perspective and what he commanded his folks when it comes to slavery, all that's like, does this, does this change the way that we think about um either God himself or the people of God? Like, does this, yeah, how, how does this maybe shape the way we think about the church mm-hmm. and the Lord? Uh, sure, it does, I guess, depending on where you came into this conversation. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah like, uh, I mean, I, I honestly hope that even in the first, whatever, 30, however long we've been talking, like, I hope that you're like, oh, wow. Um, man, even just to read the scriptures, the, the actual scriptures, not blogs or or commentary on mm-hmm. but just read the scriptures and and then you get to just kind of get to feel a bit of what's going on I, I think there's a ton of beauty in um in the fact that god cares for the lowly across the board i think mm-hmm. there's a ton of beauty um in the fact that he became lowly to break down the wall of hostility mm-hmm. uh, there's a ton of beauty um in, in that uh you know Galatians 3, there is neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free nor male, female, for you are all one in Christ. And like that is not a, um, th- that, that's a real thing um, that we get to live in light of. And so if you're not living in light of that, then, then this conversation should absolutely change the way that you uh, interact within like in a maybe more kind of cultural nuanced way of reading the Bible. There are people who just engage in these matters, or as we get to the next question, other cultural matters, mm-hmm. and they just say, you know, things like, you know, God said it, I believe it, and that's the way that it is. And it's like, oh, <laughs> I I appreciate your like your care to adhere to the scriptures. I, mm-hmm. I really but but just look at the way God engages his people. He he doesn't levitate over the muck. Mm-hmm. He doesn't just yeah. declare like in a, some booming voice, <laughs> like, I am God. Of course he's omnipresent. I'm, he's all the things he could snuff any, he could just make the whole universe go away with, without even a breath. And yet he doesn't just levitate and say, this is the way that it is, but he engages with mm-hmm. us. Mm-hmm. Certainly, perfectly in the in the person Jesus, who showed up and, and not only dwelt among us, but he didn't live in an ivory tower. Yeah. He swung a hammer and was born in a barn, you know, like, but, but even in the way that he dealt with Israel, He's walking Mm -hmm. with them. He's not unaware of who they are. He's not unaware of of their struggles. And he engages with them kind of as they are to show them a better way to live with him. Like, what a beautiful Mm -hmm. thing. I mean, I think that's like, uh, I can look back. The church, 
has a like today has a really great this weird thing of like thinking that we've progressed so far from whatever and at the same time like that the world is going to hell in a handbasket or whatever all at the same time but we think that like we've come so far and it's this weird thing of like thinking well why didn't god just say knock it off and like no. deconstruct that and just get rid of it and blow it up and it's like okay but but you're assuming that there ain't stuff right now in our, in the church at large and in this church that god like shouldn't look at and, and blow up and deconstruct yep. too. And I don't know. I think it's like a, it's a kind of an arrogant and a prideful approach to think like mm-hmm. that. Oh, he ought to do that when really what he what he did then, what he did in Jesus, what he's doing with us now, as he is he is living among us like in the Spirit. Um, he incarnated himself in Jesus, and he is being patient with us, uh, meeting us where we are, not forsaking us, and at the same time by his grace. Like, he, I don't think he wants us to just stay as we are. Like, he is about reform and renewal mm-hmm. and all those things within his people, right? And so I think we get to ask, okay, what are the things that we get to grow in right now? And, and so it doesn't, if it if it shapes my view of God at all, it's that, like, he is patient and gracious, and I want him to not open my eyes to, like, sins of the past. Although I do want to be aware of those things, but, like, for the sake of us today and the future, I, I want him to help us see the things that we're off in today that he might graciously open our eyes to and by the spirit give us new hearts and give us new desires to buck against things and do things not to make heaven on earth here because that ain't going to happen until Jesus comes back but even just within his church and within his people you know what i mean to like be a kind of people that reflect his mm-hmm. his imago day you know and all of his people um and that that seek for for justice and whatever that happens mm-hmm. to look like here in the church what's funny about that is maybe the same arrogance that would say why wouldn't he just you know lay it out there or say it or or whatever and like you probably didn't like reading um about noah when god did that either Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) you know what i'm saying like why can't god just like make a clean slate he did that (laughs) and that didn't feel very good either like and so god uh we we get to give god benefit of doubt in many ways absolutely yeah And, and but i think like wrestling with these difficult things like man gives me a yeah, it's, it's like a some beauty that he hangs out in the muck with us without mm-hmm. doing that. So yeah. I think another thing which we talk about wrestling with these things with humility is we today might not be practically enslaving people, but I think if we in our hearts or minds think someone is less because of their their money situation mm-hmm. or the way they dress or their lack of knowledge, I think I'm not dr- drawing a direct comparison, but that is a, that is kind of a form of slavery. You're placing someone in a certain category that mm-hmm. they might not choose to be in, and kind of thinking that they're less or, or less valuable or, or whatever yeah. because of something that they might not be able to control at all. And so, even though it might not be an outward sign today, we're still able to do something very similar in our hearts, but and no one would even know it. Absolutely, it's I love throughout the Old Testament and even the New Testament, we see over and over like God and His people, like reminding his people like, Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, you were slaves once and I freed you. And also, uh, you're my slaves. Like he said, he even (laughs) says that, especially when he's speaking to Paul calls himself a bond servant of Christ. Paul calls himself a slave. And so like, if we're like seeing each other and judging each other according to the flesh, Mm -hmm. Oh, that's like a, that's a diminishing thing. But when we see each other in the spirit, like, Oh, like, no, it it almost goes back to the new, new Testament idea, uh, a bit of like, who's your master like that being mm-hmm. more important than like what the heck we are first of all god calling us slaves he's not dehumanizing us or objectifying us we are his creation yeah. it's just that like our destiny and our life is bound to him mm-hmm. and we get to follow him um yeah but also like he he treasures us and he cares for us and it's a good reminder for us to like look at each other and not to judge each other based on those like outward appearances of money and status and all those things. But like we get to remind ourselves that, that we are bond servants of Christ yeah. and, and those who might, you know, not have as much as us or whatever categories of folks you might be prone to look down upon. Um, I think it is in first Corinthians seven as well. Basically Paul says the slave is free in Christ and, and Paul says that the master is a bond servant of hmm. Christ. And so it's like, you know, you get those role reversals and the the, the great equalizer is mm-hmm. the gospel, you know, at the end of the day. So Which is why he can say, if you can be free, be free. Right. And if not, that's okay. It's okay. Yeah. What? Because because he's like, I got you in regard to the way you're being treated. Right. And they're they're mine as well. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh all right, so 
Um, kind of last question here, um, which might seem a little uh, off, but I think it's it's helpful because oftentimes slavery in the scriptures uh, gets tangled up with like other cultural issues that are mm-hmm. hot button things or, or that are divisive in some ways, and so um, we can see some uh, folks drawing parallels uh, in in the scriptures from like slavery and the way it views women and mm-hmm. uh, you know sexuality and gender stuff and all these other things, and says like, well, gosh, like the Bible got it wrong here and seems to be going towards this place of freedom. Well then like, does that, does that have any sort of bearing that trajectory on any other issues as well that some folks might look at the church and say, Oh, like you were bigoted then on this Mm -hmm. thing and you were wrong because of the church's participation in some ways in slavery. Um, and then also like looking at the things that we might be bigoted about today that some folks might say, and how do you know you're not wrong about those things? So I don't know, like discuss in some ways like the relationship or not between mm-hmm. slavery and the scriptures and some of these other maybe cultural things as well. Yeah, I mean, I guess the question is like wrong side of history then, wrong side of history now, right. in the future. Right. Um, and so that is tough. Um, you said maybe the accusation would be that the Bible got it wrong um, and, and maybe a more... That's one way to look at it, um, and, and so we get to figure out what the Bible says. Right. Um, but then you kind of segued out by saying, like, the, really it's a matter of the church getting it wrong, which is mm-hmm. fair. Mm-hmm. And the church has done wicked abominations um, in the name of um, in the name of Scripture. And you have, you know, predestined African superiority, abuse of slaves, um, in a way not allowing them to... Hear the Bible mm-hmm. um, and just stuff that's just terrible. Uh, and yeah, but then so people look at these passages that we talked about and many more and make the connection and say, gosh, in the future, you're going to find, you're, you're going to see that you were on the wrong side of history. Right. And um, just like the, the church was then, um, I think the issue is, and it's, and it's not, it's not simple. I, I'm, mm-hmm. we, we aren't coming to this table as know-it-alls and we aren't, I'm not trying to make broad statements about things that are difficult. And so we know that there's a ton in all of that. And so I think you just have to determine then what, uh, what are matters of sin and what are not matters Mm -hmm. of sin. Mm -hmm. Um, and we get to engage with those matters in isolation. Yeah. Um, and so while, while we have pointed to issue of divorce, with regard to slavery, we're not saying that you build out your theology of divorce based on what the Bible says about slavery mm-hmm. um, or, or your theology of marriage or, or whatever. And so when it comes to gender and sexuality, um, we can look at history and, man, you can probably point to any, uh, certainly of the Ten Commandments and any other commandment, any, any other law, instruction in Scripture and show where the church has somehow manipulated and used that to abuse and and use that to miss the mark. And like, undoubtedly, I sit with you in that and I hate mm-hmm. that. To your point, Scott, no doubt we do that today. Yeah. No doubt that when we when we arrive in glory and, and the, the scrolls are unrolled and all the things, we're going to be like, dang, I missed, you know, but like, yeah. gosh, what a great God to love me in spite of me. And so, um, so all that to say is, is if you are someone that says slavery is biblical and I sit in that, mm-hmm. Or slavery is is uh, unbiblical, and and I reject that, or I reject the scriptures on those accounts. Then figure out what the Bible says about slavery. And if and if you're making the comparison about gender and sexuality, um, man, don't don't build it based on what the Bible says about slavery. Right. Build it on what the yeah. Bible says about uh, our identity and and who we are and gender, sexuality, and all those things. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there was a, a book. Um, Mark Knoll wrote it. It's called Civil War's Theological Crisis. Um, and I, it's a, uh, I've, I've heard him talk about it. He's uh, not the most engaging speaker. Um, but like to hear him lecture on some of those things this is interesting just to hear how even uh, yeah, pre-Civil War, like antebellum stuff, like how folks had different perspectives and different interpretations and used scripture differently based on whatever mm-hmm. side of the argument you were on, whether slavery was biblical or not whether it was affirmed mm-hmm. by scripture or not. Really interesting to see how like the hermeneutics and the interpretal, uh, interpretive principles and stuff people use to arrive at their conclusions. Um, and so I think one thing is just to like not look at the scriptures to advance whatever you want to see there, hmm. but like be open with the scriptures to see 
like what it actually does say. And to do that, to your point, like in isolation from other other things. So slavery, what the scriptures say about slavery is not what the scriptures say about women or marriage or sexuality mm-hmm. or money or whatever. You know, like pick a thing. Um, in order for us to be faithful and honest with the scriptures, we have to let it speak to what it says about this specific thing. Um, so that's part of it. Um, and that's not what happened a lot of times. Like uh, in our history is literally like they would, uh, folks who were pro-slavery, um, even if they let uh, slaves into the churches, mm-hmm. like the, the Bibles they read and what they would preach would, would not include bits about emancipation or mm-hmm. about liberty or freedom or any of those things at all. Like whole swaths of scripture were withheld from them. Um, and, and also like they were uh, told before they were baptized, hey, you have to like part of their, you know, we have folks say things mm-hmm. uh, when we baptize them up here, affirm things or whatever. Part of what uh, what folks had to affirm if they were a slave was that this wasn't going to like cause them to think that they were free now from slaves. And so like whole swaths of things that like scriptures cut out asking one thing of one group of people and something different from the other. And so, man, if, if what you're reading, first of all, isn't the whole counsel of scripture, then you're off. If you have to ignore bits or say, well, this part is scripture and this part isn't, then chances are like you may not be approaching that with like an open mind and, mm-hmm. Uh, the way that, that we would say as a Protestant church, we ought to with the full council of scriptures. And also if you're like going to say that some things apply to some people and then others and all those things and like, oh, that's <laughs> that's clearly not okay either. And so we have to be consistent in the way that we apply uh, the scriptures as well. So um, those are just some things that, that I would say to that. Like they are, they are definitely different topics, different things to, to dig into. And, and I would say this is kind of goes back to towards the beginning of the podcast is like we do get to look back with the whole council of scripture to what what did the world look like pre-fall mm-hmm. you know in creation what was god's designed created intent and yeah not just slavery wasn't a part of that but but racism was not a part mm-hmm. of that like prejudice and partiality were not part of uh, that at all um, but we do see like a unique created design of male and female and a sexual sexually complementary marriage mm-hmm. you know all those things we do see uh, headship in some ways, which is like all those things, all those things, that creative intent is affirmed consistently throughout the scriptures. Yeah. And so uh, it's really tough to like, to to not make that case then, to, or to say something different or to say, you know what I mean? So like, that's a, another way of approaching and just something to be mindful of as you're tackling the Bible and what it does say. We, we are trying to not get back to the garden, but our hope is that when Jesus returns, like the the principles and the way of life and that freedom and absence of sin and brokenness and all those things, that that will be our experience when he returns to set all things right. And it's going to be even bigger and better than the garden, you know, when he does that. And so, yeah, that's our hope. I think that's a great point. I heard someone today say something, uh, you know, this is not, you know, there was a, a cult, uh, cultural indictment on... All the things that, you know, going mm-hmm. back to my initial drawing of the fire, why are we talking about this? <laughs> yeah. Because the world feels like it's on fire at times. And um, and they were saying, like, you know, they said, that, like, this is not your grandma's, like, Christianity, your, your grandma's America or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, like, knowing, man, w- giving benefit of doubt in a statement like that, mm-hmm. um, you're probably, so they're talking about gender and mm-hmm. uh, some other justice issues or whatever. But just think about what that means to people who don't want to. Like, traditionalism is okay. Like, we're not bucking tradition just to buck it. But um, some people don't want to go back to three generations mm-hmm. from, you know. And so just when you say something like that, you're stirring in people. And, and so, like, this cultural conversation, we are oversimplifying even in this hour. Like, yep. there's so much stuff. And and so we're not, again, broad brushes are, are, are really dangerous. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's true for not just a, a biblical orthodox perspective, but the other side of things yeah. as well. And so when when someone else broad brushes um, what they think that I might be mm-hmm. coming at, mm-hmm. you know you know what I'm saying? And so it's just really dangerous uh, to broad brush without, man, like getting to the weeds and, and whatever, which is a good thing. It just leads to oversteering, you know? Yeah. Like, so yeah, we make one generalization, one stereotype over here, and then all that does is cause people who might fit that or who think that you're talking about them to do the exact same thing on the other yeah. side, yeah. it's not helpful. And at the end of the day, like our rule of faith is not 
what this person says or what category we want to fit in or not fit in. It's the scriptures, right? And so that's who, if you're a Christian listening to this, like that's our rule of faith. That's what we get to dig into and try to understand. And it's what gets to lead us uh, just as it has from the beginning all the way through today. It's what gets to lead us in righteousness and knowing what's good and what's true, whether you're in Old Testament Israel, New Testament church, or, you know, 2021 in Hamilton, Ohio, trying to figure out what gospel community looks like here. So um, any final thoughts or anything else before we kind of close this episode? What are we talking about next time? Uh, (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, it's relevant because we're going to be still hovering sort of in the same idea of cultural issues and stemming from Exodus 21 through uh, 23, um, because we also see in that chunk of scriptures, not just stuff about slavery, which might be confusing, um, but also stuff about social justice. Mm -hmm. Uh, And um, that's literally like if you're reading the SV, that's one of the (laughs) subheadings that's not in the scriptures, but it's what they place there, talks about laws concerning social justice. And it's like, okay, Um, so like we do have to talk about that. Uh, And so that's what we're going to do next week, Uh, probably maybe broken into a couple episodes. I have no idea. Um, but we'll address those things as well. And hopefully, um, with all of this content, it will help supplement, put your mind at ease, help you understand, um, some of the stuff that's going on in this text that poor Michael does not have time (laughs) to like dig into on a Sunday morning. Um, but we think is also important, um, as your pastors to lead you in understanding. So, uh, yeah. Anything else guys before we wrap up? Good. Good, cool. Yeah. All right. Well, guys, I uh, just knocked my Bible almost on the floor. Um, it's a good way to, what he thinks good way to God's end. word. That's <laughs> right. I'm done here. I don't need this anymore. Uh, thanks for listening, guys. Um, hopefully this was helpful. If you have questions uh, or anything, feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to chat with you more about this stuff. If there are things we said that are stupid or confusing or off or don't make any sense, let us know. Yep. We'd love to continue the conversation uh, with you offline. Uh, thanks, guys, and we'll see you next time.